It's that time again. Hanging out on the blockchain with my friends. My engineering friends on the Bitcoin blockchain. Hey, Block Cypher, how are you doing today? All right. Everybody, Block Cypher in purple here. We just love Block Cypher. Look for the purple. All right. Hello, Bitcoin. Is that Tone? Hey, Tone, how you doing? Tone, I don't see you this often. You don't call, you don't write. Tone Vase, ladies and gentlemen. Tone? Hi, guys. Hi, everyone. All right. That was Tone. Yeah. I think it's like the biggest crowd of rock star Bitcoin professionals, engineers, developers, scientists, beauticians like myself. Yeah, it's time to come back in. I mean, do we want to keep going? All right. Wait, nobody's laughing at me. Hey, Bitcoin. Hey, Dan, where are you calling in from? Uh, Washington. Washington. That's Washington State, right? Woo! Washington State here, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to, whoa, is that Factum? Do we have Factum in the house? Is that, oh my goodness, Factum, whoo, there you go. All right, welcome to Bitcoin, time to get seated. We're starting on the 55, we're starting on the 55. Okay, so how much time do we have left? Anyone, anyone? Bueller, Bueller, two minutes. So I got two minutes for more singing. Welcome to Bitcoin, who else I got here? I need some more targets. Whoa, we got Charlie Lee from Coinbase. Hello, Charlie. How's it going? All right. Woo, yeah. Charlie is here. If you guys haven't spoken to Charlie, you have not lived, you have not realized what life is about. Charlie Lee. All right. Welcome to Bitcoin. Do I have any more victims? All right. Oh, there you go. I'm seeing people looking at me. That's why I love it when people look at me. All right. What's your name? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Miles? Miles Carlson. Where are you calling in from, Miles? Uh, Princeton, New Jersey. Princeton, New Jersey. Woo. Is that in America? Yeah, all right. Princeton, New Jersey. Wait, what are you working on? Uh, Bitcoin research, uh, particularly with um, uh, minor behavior uh, with regards to uh, changing incentives with the uh, block reward. Awesome. Changing incentives, block rewards, minor behavior. Miles, everybody, you guys got to talk to this guy in the next break. It's awesome. Okay. So we're, uh, Connor, is Connor here? Is Connor still? They told me not to harass anybody. Okay, he's not in the bathroom, he's here, good. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna give Connor and Nathan a chance to make a prezzo again because they've done some awesome rehearsals. So they're gonna give us uh, the most technical and awesome presentation we've had so far, which is gonna be awesome. Okay, good. All right, um, and after Nathan and Connor, welcome gentlemen, awesome, we are going to have Bram. So please give it up for Nathan and Connor as they give us Bitcoin Load Spike Simulation. My name is Connor and this is Nathan and we're here to discuss our project in which we modeled uh, Bitcoin load spikes um, as far as the network in terms of transaction rates. So take it away. Okay, so uh, our goal for this project, um, well, our, our rationale, what we're interested in is um, black swan events where uh, many transactions arrive in a short period of time. Um, so this could be because of DOS attacks, so just a few entities creating many transactions, or there could be um, events where many different people want to make a transaction, and it could be benign, like a shopping spree. Um, so we wanted to answer two questions. Um, how does a temporary spike in transaction rate affect confirmation delay distribution? Um, and for a given spike shape, if we could magically change the block size, how would that affect the evolution of the system? <coughs> so our simulation was mainly based off of the Bitcoin traffic bulletin number 34. Um, so I don't know if you guys are familiar with this post, but in that simulation, um, the author models both transaction rates and uh, blockchain, or sorry, um, block mining rates in a Poisson distribution, and then calculates the expected um, time for a transaction to be confirmed. So we took the same sort of style and then made a couple changes to the actual model. Uh, our mempool's model has an infinite FIFO queue, so transactions are uh, continuously appended to this queue and then processed uh, in each block. Uh, we used a constant uh, transaction size of 250 bytes, and 
the main ways in which our model differs from the, uh, the Bitcoin traffic bulletin is that our blockchain, or sorry, our, um, our block size is variable, so we can actually adjust the rate or the size of the block for a given simulation, as well as define spike profiles, in which, as you see on the right, we have this um, time varying spike. Um, and so we can actually model that into the simulation so that we have a different loads at different points in the simulation so we can uh, log the confirmation times for each one of those spikes um, and see the uh, comparison. Um, oh, one other thing about oh, sure. this slide is that um, uh, probably Poisson distribution for block arrival rate makes sense because hopefully um, the chance of finding two different blocks is completely independent. Um, transaction arrival rate as a Poisson distribution is, uh, you know, like a, a simple way to approach it, but our whole premise is that transactions sometimes violate the assumptions of Poisson distribution, which is uh, independence of events within a time period. So, uh, yeah, we're accounting for that by varying the Poisson distribution's rate in that step function. All right, so um, this is an example of the Bitcoin traffic bulletin's results. Um, so here we have uh, an S-curve essentially d displaying the cumulative probability distribution of a transaction's confirmation time given the load on the network. So on the right-hand side, you see a legend that is goes from 0.1% to 100% of the Bitcoin loads network. And you see going across the graph that those transaction times d tend to increase and increase, and the separation increases um, with the increase in load. So for example, the far most left curve terminates at about 380-ish seconds, so just over five, six minutes. Which is a really low transaction rate. Which is what you'd expect from a essentially empty network versus all the way on the right, the purple plot um, is about 10,000 seconds per, per transaction. So you can see like the huge increase just based on the, the, um, the load of the network. That's, uh, yeah, so on the right, 100% transaction rate means um, in this model, uh, 3.5 transactions per second, which is just you know, proportional to the block size and how large transactions are. Um, and another thing to point out is the time scale on the x-axis is logarithmic. So even though the S-curves all look to have the same shape, um, the tails are a lot worse as the load gets high. So you know, it could be, I don't know the exact here, like if we, it could be the case that like 20% uh, of transactions have to wait over three hours or something like that once the load is high enough. Um, so th this is the result from Bitcoin traffic bulletin uh, and that we're trying to extend. Oh, um, so we don't have results that we felt comfortable sharing because we think we have bugs. So. Uh, <laughs> Sadly, we just have this sketch of what you could imagine. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> hopefully, yeah, you could tell us if you would like to see these results and you think they would be useful. So um, kind of a sketch of what we wanted to do is have a, um, a time series plot showing the rate jump up in the square wave. Um, and then we expect that if we plotted the mempool size over time, and smooth that, it would look like what you see here. So the memory pool starts growing, assuming the, the high rate is higher than the um, capacity of the network. Um, and then we expect the, the memory pool would drain over time after the spike ends, and if that were to occur in a fictional universe. Um, so we would be interested in like how long is that hump? So how long does it take the memory pool to drain? Um, and we would be interested to, uh, at each of these arrows, create another distribution plot like the one uh, from the original model and see what's different. Um, and I think one thing, one thing to note on that is that the original simulation, you, uh, you fix a block size and fix the transaction rate. Um, and because we're actually varying the transaction rate, we can model spikes that are, say, tens or thousands of times the normal Bitcoin um, like network transaction rate uh, and then see the network's response to that as opposed to just uh, being able to fix a constant rate that's above one or ab above 100 percent of the network capacity because then you just have an infinite growing pool. So uh, we're able to see those network responses in our simulation. Thank you. So um, right, and then the next step is imagine a different block size and see how that changes the length of this curve. Um, 
So this is a, we need to do further work, obviously, but uh, one thing we need to do is um, more background work because uh, this seems like a fairly simple um, problem or model that would probably exist elsewhere um, in uh, the history of like router design or evolution. Um, and we're not that familiar with queuing theory, so this is sort of like our weekend project to discover for ourselves. Um, and also, I wouldn't be at all surprised if um, there's other work specific to Bitcoin that we're just not aware of because there's uh, many fire hoses on the net of information about Bitcoin. Um, and then as far as future work and how we plan to improve our model, so um, given that the, you know, the general philosophy or the outcome of the simulation may be similar to um, events in queuing theory, we want to explain our model so that it's more powerful and able to handle certain cases um, and get like more accurate simula simulations for the Bitcoin network itself. Um, one thing we'd like to do is compare against empirical data, so look back through uh, previous transaction rates, uh, just to compare how our load spike simulation uh, is, uh, or fits real imperative data that we see in history. Um, and the second way is that we want to expand our simulation to include uh, things like trans transaction loss, um, when the user resubmits transaction, as well as replace by fee. So, and that is uh, reordering transactions in the queue. Because like I said earlier, our model is currently a FIFO queue, so no transactions are lost. Um, and fees do not take into account uh, in our simulation. So, yep. um, expanding on those, I think, would help um, give us a more accurate model of the actual load spike simulation uh, for Bitcoin. Thank you. So, yeah, I just wanted to say one last bit about exploring um, queue, queue uh, reordering and, and things like that. It's my personal interest with this project because um, I think there's been a lot of discussion about, I mean, there's been discussion about both of these topics, but some people are focused on um, for the um, standard operation of the network, how much load can it handle? Um, but there's also the exceptional case of denial, denial of service attack or shopping sprees. And I'm particularly interested in learning more about the mechanics uh, between user behavior and miners, so the connection between um, wallets and, and miners or full nodes. So, yeah, that's it for us. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Nathan and Connor. Awesome. And that wraps up testing, simulation, and modeling for us. And, well, lunch is coming, and I'm hungry. I know you guys are hungry, too. But before we go for lunch, we got to do economic incentives. And we have three awesome presentations launching with uh, Bram uh, coming up there. Cohen should be awesome, talking about how wallets can handle real transaction fees. Please give Bram a hand. Yeah. you're doing it. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk on how wallets can handle real transaction fees on the assumption that we hit the block size limit and we get real transaction fees, meaning something that's not uh, completely de minimis. The idea here is that you should have a market at this point where some number of transactions just never happen because they're not willing to pay the necessary fee in order to make that happen, and you get some kind of equilibrium price uh, going on. I, for one, actually at proactively want to see this happen because we don't know what fees should be until we actually run the experiment of doing it and see what prices wind up being. In order for that to happen, wallets need to be able to do their price setting in some way. And currently, for the most part, they uh, just kind of don't. So I'm going to talk about how they can be made to do that. Uh, first off, some ground rules here. I'm only talking about consumer wallets. Uh, there's lots of other actors in the ecosystem who might want to handle fees in various and sundry ways. I'm not going to talk about them. Uh, also, uh, there's no microchannels. Microchannels most definitely should be supported eventually, but I'm just dealing with the simpler case here where you have a wallet and it's trying to make payments. Uh, I'm also assuming that replace by fee is in effect because uh, this whole thing doesn't work unless replaced by fee is in effect. Yeah, you'll see it, it, uh, it, it 
the whole way you need to uh, do payments is pretty seriously broken unless you can simply increase fees. And in fact, this assumes fairly aggressive replace by fee. If you have replace by fee, you need to have some kind of anti-spam, uh, anti-DOS measure in there where someone can't uh, repeatedly reintroduce the same uh, transaction but increased by epsilon every single time. So you need to have some kind of policy about how much they have to have uh, increased it by in order to prevent uh, denial of service on the network as a whole that way. Uh, and I'm assuming that it allows actually for fairly aggressive uh, replacing where it only goes up by a small amount. Uh, actually, uh, the conclusion I come to here is that the replacement shouldn't be based on the amount that it goes up, but rather that you have a policy that uh, transactions can only be replaced once per block. It's only after a fee has actually failed to go through for one block that you will allow a replacement for it uh, to be added. But I'll get back to that. So first question, what should transaction fees uh, B. Uh, well, the simplest answer is it's well supply and demand. You have your supply, you have your demand, they meet in the middle, this tells you what the price is. Uh, but that assumes an extraordinarily simplified model of the world that only happens at one point in time. Uh, in real life, uh, both uh, the supply of available transaction space is extremely noisy and demand for it is noisy as well. And on top of that, you have uh, day, night, and weekly cycles, that you have you know, periods in the middle of the night where the sun is over the Pacific Ocean where there's just no transactions happening at all, and you have periods in the middle of the day where there's quite a bit of uh, demand for stuff. So what should happen really is there should be a time trade-off. If you're willing to wait longer, particularly if you're willing to wait overnight, you should be paying much, much lower transaction fees than if you feel you really need to have your transaction go through immediately. And that's the really important insight here. Uh, the, then there's the next question of what should the wallet UX be? Uh, this is going to have to affect uh, the user experience of using a wallet uh, because they need to say something about transactions. Uh, specifically, they need new inputs. They need to somehow allow a user to specify what the maximum fee they're willing to spend on a transaction is and how long uh, the wallet should go about trying to uh, do a send until it gives up because it's not willing to pay the fee that's required. This doesn't mean that the user experience needs to literally ha ask the user exactly these things, but somehow uh, this needs to be added to the flow. And there also needs to be a state when you attempt to send a coin to someone that the wallet needs to be able to say, hey, I failed to do that. I was not able to send it within the time allowed for the uh, fee that you said you were willing to spend on it. Uh, this actually hits a problem right here. Currently in Bitcoin, there's no way of making it so that a transaction can't happen above a particular block height. You can make it so it can't happen below a certain block height, uh, but the other thing where it just goes bad eventually isn't there, uh, somewhat by design actually. Um, this creates a real problem because if a transaction fails, it's now in limbo. There's no way of saying, hey, if it didn't happen by then, it's just dead. It now goes into this limbo state where it didn't happen by then and whoever was trying to send it might start behaving in ways that assume that it's never going to happen at all, but you have no way of having an assurance of this. The only way of making it so that it can never go through is to spend the input to it, and that, it has to, that requires the exact same fee that you weren't willing to pay in order to get your first spend to go through. So this is actually a pretty significant problem right here, and I uh, would like to strongly advocate that uh, an extension to Bitcoin to allow that functionality uh, be added, uh, because I think it's important. And it's not a, it's not a complex uh, extension to add, but it might be somewhat controversial. Uh, so there's a question of what do you actually do? What, what, what behavior should wallets have? So the first question is what information can they use? They can look at what transaction fees have been in previous blocks, they can look at what's currently in the mempool, and they can use their local information. They can look at what transaction fees they locally had to pay previously, and they can look at how long they've been going on on the current uh, payment attempt. 
So there are some problems with the more obvious inputs here, uh, uh, particularly what fees were paid in the past. If you do something where you go, well, I'm just going to look at what fees were paid in the past and just add a little to make sure mine goes through, you can get these crazy spirals where you get a whole lot of peers paying way, way more than they need to for their transactions just off of tradition and momentum uh, based on what uh, transaction fees were in previous blocks. And this creates tremendous incentive for miners to pump up the price, like really exaggerate the price in one mining block uh, because that might force prices up and keep them there persistently for a while at much, much higher amounts than they should have been. Uh, to begin with. Um, and even using stuff that's currently in the mempool re requires that SPV clients go and ask full nodes what's in your mempool and set their transaction fees accordingly, which is trivially pumpable by uh, miners going and setting up a whole bunch of fake full nodes just so that they can report higher transaction fees than they should be to SPV clients. And that is a fairly trivial attack with a really clear direct incentive to do it. So you really don't want to rely on that information. Uh, what you do want to do is just use your local info because that's completely reliable. You know you can trust it. Uh, so the first thing you do is you pick a starting point. You're, you're going to start at a low value and increase to a large value. So you start with either a completely de minimis value, like one Satoshi, if you've never sent something before. And if you have sent payments before, you take your last payment amount times something, like a half or a tenth or something like that, as your starting value. Uh, you then, I, I give some math here, you then exponentially increase this up to the maximum you're willing to spend uh, at the end of the amount of time you're uh, willing to go, which I'm assuming you're measuring in blocks. So it's a little noisy towards the end there, but I'm assuming it's measured in blocks. Um, and all this formula is really saying is you go up exponentially, and I have a funny thing at the bottom there which says you add a small amount at random at the beginning to avoid problems where everyone happens to be using the exact same magic values, which can cause everyone to offer the exact same amount all the way up, which it causes bad things to happen. Uh, so uh, that's basically my answer as to what should be done. I believe that's a conservative approach. It clearly works. It's easy to implement. It can't be gamed in uh, horrible ways. Uh, there's an interesting side question of what happens with your UTXO combining. You have a wallet full of uh, UTXOs, and you need to decide which ones to use into inputs into the next output. And this is going to affect the size of it, uh, which affects how much you have to pay. It turns out this matters surprisingly little, because uh, every s new input that you get, every new piece of change in your wallet will eventually ha have to be combined, and you will at some point have to pay the price for that, it doesn't really matter when it is. It's going to happen at some point. Uh, so your algorithms for deciding what inputs should be put into each new output aren't really affected uh, all that much. You possibly could uh, try and create transactions for uh, doing your combinations at times when transaction fees are very low, because you really, really don't care when those happen, and you can do them at your leisure. So that might be a good idea. Um, there is, are some possible extensions which could help in terms of making your uh, transactions smaller. One of them is if you're using Schnorr signatures and something has multiple inputs, you could use the combined Schnorr signature on those, which would actually be a rather nice extension to have once you have Schnorr signatures uh, and would save you some space. But it still requires that you reveal the public keys of all of your inputs, which is space. Uh, a better one would be that if you have two inputs, both of which need to be signed by the exact same value, that you only need to include the signature once. Right now, you pointlessly need to include the signature twice. Um, if that's added as an extension and it's used properly, which is a major caveat, then it pushes back the reveal on those things going to the same output, but only by like one generation. Uh, so it's a pretty substantial uh, uh, savings in size of your transaction uh, without a big hit to privacy. Uh, finally, something you could do that might really add something is every time you uh, have a public key that has 
ever been used in the history of the blockchain. You don't have to reveal the public key again because it was already given once. I believe that's an extraordinarily bad idea, very bad for privacy, and doesn't really save all that much uh, space because you still need a, a new signature from it. Uh, and so that's the, the basics of how I think wallets should handle uh, transaction fees. Uh, I am hoping that uh, the that this gets in, that the extensions I've mentioned get done, and that the and replaced by fee happens as policy, and this all gets put into standard wallet software well in advance of any real fee pressure. So the market is already there and able to handle it at such time as it does happen. All right, thank you, Bram. Hold on a second, Bram. Uh, just to confirm, uh, is it true that you're a poet? Uh, <laughs> and is it true that you will be performing uh, later tonight? Yeah I, yeah, I believe later. Because I can't be the only performer here, right? Uh, yeah, I, I believe later on I'm going to be performing. As awesome, so we look forward to it. Yes. Awesome, thank you, Bram, guys. All right. Okay, two more to go. Uh, Rockstar Peter R. In the house. Uh, I've read Peter R's post uh, so many times, and I've never seen the man in, in person, and here he is. It's amazing. Wow. I've been talking to him, and I didn't even know who he was. Okay. Blow my mind. I'm just like, <laughs> it's like rock stars. I'm such a Bitcoin groupie. Oh, my God. Peter R is here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, Peter R, let's do it. All right. Good afternoon, my name is Peter Risen, and today I'm gonna to be speaking about my paper, A Transaction Fee Market Exists Without a Block Size Limit. I have that asterisk there to remind me that there's two provisos to this claim. Number one, we need for Bitcoin's inflation rate to be non-zero. And number two, we need for more than one miner or mining pool to exist. Now underneath my blazer, I'm wearing my Bitcoin miners t-shirt. This helps me to think like a Bitcoin miner. <laughs> now most people think that the job of a miner is to find the magic nonce value that allows a new block to be appended to the blockchain. While that is true, miners have another job as well. Miners are also commodity producers. They produce a new type of digital commodity unlike anything the world has ever seen before called block space or room in a block for transactional data. Now, before I explain why block space can be considered a normal economic commodity, let's first explore what the field of economics tells us about the production of such commodities. In this chart, I mean, sorry, in this talk, we'll be looking at several charts and we'll all share the same axes. On the horizontal, we'll plot the quantity of the commodity. That's the total number of apples produced per year or the total number of bytes per block. On the vertical, we'll plot the unit price of the commodity. That's the price of one apple, or the price of one transaction's worth of block space. The coordinates of a point thus simultaneously represent the price and quantity of that commodity. The law of demand states that as the unit price for a commodity increases, the total quantity demanded by the market tends to decrease. Conversely, as the price falls, the total quantity increases. Now we can imagine appending a bunch of points like that to form what's called the demand curve. Now what's interesting about the demand curve is that if the price per unit gets low enough, the quantity demanded can become arbitrarily high. In other words, demand can be considered infinite. Now this is something I hear regarding the block size limit debate. People say we need a limit because the demand for block space can be considered infinite. Well, economists struggled with that conundrum too, but they solved it over 100 years ago now. And the way, the way they wrapped their head around it was to postulate a new law that, as you might have guessed, is called the law of supply. The law of supply is sort of the opposite to the law of demand. It says, it will, it says that producers will only produce more if they get paid more to do so. Apple farmers will only plant more trees if they can make more money by doing so. Bitcoin miners will only make their blocks bigger if they get more Bitcoins for doing so. The supply curve thus has a positive slope, the demand curve has a negative slope, and the two intersect here at what's called the free market equilibrium. The point on the vertical is the P star, and the point on the horizontal is Q star, the equilibrium quantity produced. 
Again, even though demand can be considered infinite, we still get a finite quantity produced. So is block space a normal economic commodity? Well, does it satisfy the laws of supply and demand? I think everybody here agrees that it satisfies the law of demand. It just makes sense that as the unit price to, for writing to the blockchain decreases, more data will get written to the blockchain. But does block space also satisfy the law of supply? At first glance, it might seem that if a, min that a miner could just add as many transactions to he wants for free to a block. If that were the case, then the supply curve would flatline at zero like this. Supply and demand would never meet, and we'd have a tragedy of the commons where our blockchain fills up with spam. Now, to solve this problem, I use the scare quotes because it's not really a problem, as we'll see later, but there was a recent proposal called FlexCap. And FlexCap is interesting because it basically is artificially simulating the supply curve of a, norm of a normal commodity. The idea is that the network would charge miners more and more the bigger they wanted to make their blocks. This would result in a forced equilibrium as opposed to a free market equilibrium, but a finite quantity of block space nonetheless. Now there's one big problem with FlexCap. It's that it requires a centralized group of people to decide what is the right price for block space. And if a centralized group of people get to decide that, well then they can also decide winners and losers by adjusting that price. Fortunately, we don't need cap due to a phenomenon called orphaning that I'll describe next. So what is orphaning? Well, normally when a miner finds a block, he turns purple here, he broadcasts it to the other miners, they all start happily mining away, and if that guy at the bottom there finds a block a little bit later, well, everybody ignores him. The miner at the top is happy, he gets the block reward. Now let's imagine that this time that miner mines a really big block it propagates more slowly. Now when our miner at the bottom mines his small block, his spreads much faster. Everybody thinks the small block came first even though it didn't. The miner at the top loses the block reward. His block gets orphaned. But the miner at the bottom, he's happy. Now orphaning isn't some hypothetical theoretical construct. It really happened. There were 155 blocks orphaned in the first quarter of this year and 97 orphaned in the second quarter for about a 1% orphaning rate. So now that we know that orphaning is real, how does it affect the miner's cost of production for block space? Well, if a miner finds a block, he gets the block reward plus any fees from the transactions included in his block. If we want to look at his expected revenue per block, well, that's what he would earn multiplied by his probability of winning that block, which is just the ratio of his hash rate to the network hash rate. Now this is almost exact, but we need one more term to account for the fact that the bigger the block is, the more likely it is to be orphaned. My paper shows that we can model this as a decaying exponential in the propagation time. Now there's two things the miner here can control. He can control the fees, and he can control the propagation time. He can get more fees by making his block bigger, but he can uh, have a less chance of orphaning by making his block smaller. In other words, the miner must choose to balance between fees and orphaning risk in order to maximize profit. Okay, so anyways, with a bit of algebra and a bit of calculus, it follows from that equation that the cost per byte for the miner to produce block space is proportional to Bitcoin's inflation rate times a term that grows exponentially in the propagation time. This is exciting because we're showing that there's a real cost to produce block space. But it also brings up proviso number one from the beginning. If the inflation rate is zero when the block reward runs out, it's not clear what happens to the production costs. Anyways, what we want to do is we want to get a supply curve. So we want to get that equation in terms of the total quantity of the commodity produced. There's a theorem from physics called the Shannon-Hartley theorem, which basically says that the amount of time it takes to communicate some amount of information is proportional to the amount of information communicated. We can use that to write the cost per byte uh, instead of as to the propagation time to something called the propagation impedance times the block size. The propagation impedance is just how many seconds it takes to communicate a megabyte of block information. So this is pretty cool because now we've shown that the cost grows exponentially in the block size. Why is that cool? Because, well, let's go back to our supply curve. Remember, uh, FlexCap wanted to make that supply curve increase so it got more expensive the bigger the block gets. Well, we've shown that 
Bitcoin already has that property. It already behaves exactly like this. But instead of a forced market equilibrium, we would get a free market equilibrium. If we get a bunch more users coming in and demand for block space increases, well, that shifts the demand curve up. The price for block space goes up, the quantity produced gets a bit bigger, but we still reach an equilibrium point. If later miners work together and they can more efficiently propagate their blocks, well, that drops the supply curve. The price falls, the total quantity grows, but uh, we still achieve equilibrium. In other words, a free market exists without a block size limit. Objections. What if a group of miners decides everyone's block contents beforehand? So the idea is that they all decide what they're working on beforehand. So this group of miners, they never orphan each other's blocks. Well, sure, that's called a mining pool. But that doesn't affect the fee market because the mining pool still need to transmit the block solutions between each other. Last proviso, I said we need the inflation rate to be non-zero and I said we needed more than one miner or mining pool to exist. If everybody joins the same pool, well now there's nobody to lose orphan races to and the fee market no longer holds. <coughs> okay, so I've explained that we don't strictly need a block size limit, but do we want a block size limit? Well, economics helps us to answer that question too. When Satoshi Nakamoto first put the block size limit in place, it served as an anti-spam measure. It was above the free market equilibrium point, so it didn't distort the free market dynamics. It was actually 800 times greater than Q star, so it would have been like a block down the road that way instead. Over the last five years, Bitcoin has grown tremendously, and I now believe the block size limit is on this side of Q star. It's now acting as a political measure and is resulting in what economics calls a dead weight loss. That's the loss of economic activity as a result of this production quota. Now, some people think that production quotas can still be positive if they serve to reduce or eliminate some negative externality. I'm not gonna weigh in on whether I think a negative externality exists. Instead, I'm gonna say, if how could a group enforce a production quota against the will of the market? The market wants to be at Q star, the production force quota is forcing it to be at Q max. How will a group fight the invisible hand of the market? Well, I think they would follow the playbook of other command and control regimes. They would probably censor people who speak out against the quota to make it seem like everybody thinks the quote is a good idea. So this is not a completely hypothetical example. <laughs> then we have our obligatory Star Wars misquote. And indeed, we see that nodes are slipping through their fingers. Lastly, we'd expect attacks on infrastructure. And indeed, that is exactly what we're seeing. In the end, I believe the production quota would fail. And the reason is because we can only really enforce the rules that most people agree with anyways. Bitcoin will break down dams erected by special interest groups attempting to block the stream of transactions. That's all I have to say on the transaction fee market. Before, before I go, <laughs> before I go, I wanted to, uh, to follow up with what Andrew Miller said. So we are very excited to be launching Ledger, the world's first peer-reviewed academic journal dedicated to Bitcoin research. We are proud to be supported by a distinguished editorial board with uh, leaders from academia and Bitcoin industry. We have Oxford, Cornell, Stanford, Coin Center, Blockstream, Ethereum, New York Law School, MIT, Duke University, all represented. And we will be making our call for papers on Tuesday. So listen up, guys. Thank you. Woo! Peter. Economics 101. Thank you very, very much.
Don't block the stream, people. Don't block the stream. All right. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> it was good. It was good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, before uh, you go up, Miles, uh, one second. Miles is going to create a break presentation. This is the last presentation before lunch. Is there anybody here hungry? Oh, come on. Tell me how you really feel. Are you hungry? Good. So because you're hungry, the best way to deal with hunger is to deny yourself for a short period of time before you reward yourself. But to deal with the hunger, you need to move the blood a bit. So I'm going to ask everybody to stand up for one minute before Miles makes his presentation because this is awesome. He's from a part of America they call Princeton. All right. I, Princeton. I went to Columbia. I'm sorry. I had to do the dig. All right. Great. And I want us to all stretch up. Woo! And stretch out. And say, let's scale Bitcoin. No, 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 no. Dad, no. <laughs> Come on. All right. One more time for the folks back home. Let's scale Bitcoin. Thank you very much. Take your seats. Miles, you have the floor. Uh, hello, everybody. My name's uh, Miles Carlson. I'm here from Princeton University to tell you guys about some of the uh, new research that we've been doing with regards to uh, the changes in, in minor incentives in the face of a uh, diminishing block minting reward. Uh, during my talk, I'm first going to demonstrate that miners are actually going to be incentivized to not mine uh, for some fraction of the time while they're solving the, uh, the cryptographic hash puzzle for their blocks. I'm then going to talk about um, the future of uh, miners purchasing minor hardware. And then I'm going to move into talking about the impact that this is going to have on the Bitcoin system and what's going to happen. And I'm going to present some results of simulations that, that we've created. Finally, I'm going to talk about um, the impact that this has on the Bitcoin community and what this means for the discussions that the Bitcoin community needs to have. So I'm going to, I'm going to start this talk uh, with the block reward. So the block reward is the combination of a minting reward and transaction fees that, that a miner can stick into their block. So the idea has always been that as the minting reward goes down, um, the transaction fees will increase over time and kind of you know, keep the miners earning about the same amount of money. Even if this works, even if the miners are able to earn as much from their transaction fees as they were from the minting reward, are these two really equivalent? And the answer is, you know, not necessarily, because the transaction fees um, have an interesting feature that they can be time dependent, in the sense that um, a miner can only claim transaction fees as the transactions are added to their block. This means that as the transaction fees start to dominate the block reward more and more than the minting fee, the block reward itself becomes sort of time dependent. That's what we're interested in here. We're modeling the block reward as this linear function of time. We've got this, this factor B, which could be the, the initial minting reward, but, but it's just what the block is worth at time zero. And then we've got some, some scaling factor, some, some A of T, that, that uh, the block increases in value with time. So something that can be added to this plot is that um, miners have like a set expense to mine a block. If a block is not worth a certain amount, it's not worth the electricity for the miner to mine that block. If we, if we look at this threshold, um, above the threshold is worth the miner's time to mine the block, but below this threshold, it's not actually worth the miner's time to mine a block. Now, if we consider this uh, red, red plot of what the block is worth over multiple blocks, you'll see something kind of interesting. There are these periods that it's worth a miner's time to mine, and there are these periods where it's not. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to be referring to these times where it's not worth a miner's time to mine, as the mining gaps. OK, so I'm going to take a break from the mining gaps and talk about the future of hardware. So mining hardware is becoming more and more commoditized. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that the efficiency of mining hardware isn't changing very much. In addition to that, mining hardware is becoming cheaper and cheaper. Moore's law is not in effect here when it comes to the mining hardware efficiency. And the cheaper, longer lasting miner hardware will mean that it's more available to everyone, and that's going to have effects um, with regard to the block size. And I'll tie these ideas together in just a moment. This is a plot that, that we've taken data from uh, the Bitcoin Wiki mining uh, hardware comparison page. And what you see here is you see um, 
the five most efficient machines cited on the page for, for a variety of different dates. And we've selected the, the five most efficient machines because, uh, and it, it says this clearly on the page that you know some of the uh, mining hardware companies fudge their numbers a little bit to kind of take advantage of miners. But what you see here is kind of interesting. It's definitely very much a step function, which actually makes a lot of sense. When you consider that the mining hardware initially started at graphics cards and then went to FPGAs and then transitioned into ASICs. What's also interesting about this plot is that if you look within a single generation of hardware, particularly if you look within ASICs, uh, the efficiency hasn't changed much. Like this plot shows very clearly that over the last 18 months, there hasn't been much of an efficiency change in the, the mining hardware in the form of ASICs. In addition to that, what we see is that the price of ASICs have actually been going down when you measure it uh, in the dollar cost for a machine for the number of giga hashes per second the machine can compute. So what's important between these two ideas is that um, the efficiency isn't changing, so mining hardware isn't being outdated. Your machine isn't being made obsolete. It's not that your machine is no longer going to be effective at computing hashes. It's going to cost too much. And in addition, it's going to be easier for people to acquire reasonable amounts of hash power because the cost of this hash power is going down. So what, what, what does this mean? Can we, can we attach numbers to, to this gap? Um, this starts with how the gap is calculated. So all, all miners will independently make this decision about, about when they decide to start mining. And they're going to be making this decision on an instantaneous basis. Uh, essentially, this, this decision breaks down to whether or not the cost in electricity of computing a hash is, is less than the expected reward for each hash that they compute. So we, we have created a mathematical framework, which we are continuing to develop, that describes when exactly it's optimal for these miners to start mining. As a proof of concept, we also have simulations that show that this is indeed an ideal time for the miners to start mining. In this simulation, we try to model the Bitcoin network as accurately as we can using uh, parameters that are found in the Bitcoin network today. The only thing that we do is we change the block reward by decreasing it and increase the amount of money that profit or the amount of profits that miners are making from the transaction fees. Using these parameters, uh, our, our mathematical model predicts an ideal gap of about 170 seconds. So in this simulation, we have the majority of miners mining at this ideal gap. And what we show is that if any miner tries to leave this ideal gap and starts mining earlier or starts mining later, their profits actually go down. So what does this mean for the future? Can we predict when the gap is going to occur, what the gap is going to look like as time goes on, things of this kind of nature? Well, if we make the economic argument that miners take their profits and invest it back into the market in the form of buying new uh, mining hardware, we can. We can model what's going to happen to the gap, and we can model the behavior of the gap in the future. In this simulation, uh, we have uh, time on the, the x-axis, and we have the, uh, the predicted ideal gap on the y-axis. And to kind of orient you, uh, we have the x-axis labeled by block number. And we're, we're about here. We're at block 370,000. So what this predicts is that, um, oh, and this uses the same, the same model for the, the Bitcoin system, trying to keep it as realistic as possible. Uh, and this one, we've got the actual uh, block minting reward. And we uh, make the assumption that uh, A will, um, as, as, the block reward, as the minting reward is diminished, what is cut out of the minting reward will be uh, rolled into the transaction fees. And actually, we found that our exact description of what happens to A is actually not super relevant. We see very similar effects uh, regardless. But, but back to the plot. So what you see here is that at the next block halving, it will actually be ideal for miners to mine with a gap. And in addition, as miners invest their money back into the system, it's going to make the ideal gap actually increase. Now. I was talking about the commoditization of hardware earlier, and, that's where this, and this is where that comes into play. This curve actually gets worse as hardware becomes commoditized. As miners are able to buy more hardware for less, and as their hardware doesn't essentially become obsolete, this curve becomes more steep. And the rate at which this ideal gap approaches 600 seconds becomes much, much more quick. So what is the takeaway of this, this prediction? Well, an important one is that we think that a gap will actually be profitable at the next block halving. Additionally, we think that uh, long in the future, this, this gap actually approaches 600 seconds. And then uh, as a final point, this, this issue is made worse by the fact that, that hardware is becoming commoditized. 
So this has obvious security implications. Um, this increases the vulnerability to attack. And the reason that it increases the vulnerability to attack is if a adversary is willing to mine suboptimally, start mining right away, they're able to increase their perceived hash power in the network. So in this simulation, we have uh, uh, the majority of miners mining at some, some gap. And we show that if uh, an attacker starts mining right away, what fraction of the overall hash rate they need in order to mine half the blocks? What, fa what fraction of the real hash rate they need in order to essentially perform a 51% attack? And as you can see, as the gap deviates from zero, the fraction of hash power that uh, an attacker needs like quickly drops from, from 50%. So this is, a, this is a real issue and a real threat to the security of Bitcoin. So what does this mean? Well, it means that a block really needs to be immediately profitable to mine. Um, an assumption that was made by this model is that there's no backlog of transactions. But that's a tricky issue in itself because the backlog of transactions that would ne be needed to solve this issue, the backlog would need to constantly have enough value in it that a block is always immediately profitable to mine. And this has all sorts of negative side effects. Because, I mean, the most obvious of which is that a users, our users are going to have to wait potentially long periods of time to get their uh, transactions into the blockchain. Um, at, at Princeton, uh, we're researching lots of different aspects of Bitcoin, and we just released a, uh, a Bitcoin MOOC on uh, Coursera. And the exact description of this uh, backlog is something that we're also trying to explore with future work. What I hope you get out of this presentation is that this mining gap is a, is a real issue that needs to be part of the discussion uh, when it comes to scaling Bitcoin. In particular, it's a very important issue when it comes to considering the change in uh, the block size. Thank you, and uh, I'm not actually answering questions now, but if you find me uh, at lunch, I'd be more than happy to answer any of your questions. Awesome, thank you. Miles, awesome presentation, thank you. All right, everybody, uh, so we are 30 minutes of free time before lunch. Would you believe it? We've been going so fast. And as such, because uh, lunch starts exactly at 1.13, um, you may now do something awesome. You may look to the person to your right or to your left who you've never met before, and you may say to them, hi, what do you work on in Bitcoin? What's your name? Or, dude, that MC is really funny, isn't he? So I encourage you to do that for the next 30 minutes <laughs> before lunch, and after which, we're going to have you dine in a wonderful, wonderful enjoyment. Please have fun. 113. Thank you.